name is Destiny Mann. I am the program director at Mankato Youth Place, and I am also a licensed cosmetologist, and I work at my family's salon and barbershop. It's called Northside Hair Company, and we are located in North Mankato. Something that is unique about us compared to other places in Mankato is that we are a multicultural salon, so we serve anybody who walks through our door. Uh, my mom is a stylist there as well, and she is white. My stepdad is a barber there, and he's black. Um, I'm biracial, and six of my of us seven kids are biracial. Um, so I come from a blended family, and that kind of changes my experience growing up, um, partially in Mankato. I grew up in Dallas, Texas for the most part, but I was born here. Um, I went to Dakota Meadows for two years, and I went to West High School for a bit too, so kind of have different experiences in different places. It's very different. It makes it, um, I feel like even almost more difficult than just being black sometimes because you get it from both sides. You're not black enough sometimes and you're not white enough all the time. <laughs> um, so you really, you really get it from both sides. I've been told that I'm confused about my identity and that I don't um, connect with my white side enough, that I don't connect with my black side enough. Like, just literally from both sides all the time it came, depending on who it was coming from, was, oh, why are you acting so black? Or why are you acting so white? Or even just being educated, like, oh, you, like, my, my white friends would sometimes say, like, you're not like other black people, or why don't you talk like black people? Why don't you sound like you're black? Or just small things like that, that a lot of people oftentimes don't realize are problematic and weird things to say. I enjoy being a person of color. I would not change it. It's extremely difficult in today's society, especially here in Mankato and in Southern Minnesota as in general. Um, it, it's definitely difficult here. You definitely go places and you're like, oh, I'm the only brown person here. And my family and I kind of have a running joke about that. Like we'll go in places in public and we'll just like count how many people <laughs> Because it's just coming from growing up in Dallas, it's so different. It's and it's odd. You feel like you're being like watched and you feel like it's not normal for you to be somewhere that is completely normal for you to be. Um, but I still wouldn't change it. I think that we're powerful and we're awesome and we have a lot of we have we as a community have a lot of different strengths and traits that other communities don't have and we offer our own we bring our own things to the table. Growing up in Dallas was a lot different from being here when I came back here in middle school and I was in different like suburbs of Dallas I wasn't really like deep like in downtown Dallas or anything like that but um, it was very different you you feel a, a different sense of community there everybody is people are just people everybody like there's white people, there's Hispanic, Asian, everybody. And then I came back here in middle school in 2007, I believe, 2006, 2007. I came like the last half of sixth grade and I went to Garfield and then I went to Dakota Meadows and that was just like really, really, really different. And it was very strange for me coming from a place that was so diverse. Um, there was a handful of us that were biracial and then I think we had three or four in our grade, in my seventh grade year, that were full on black. And then we had an Asian girl and a couple Hispanic people, um, but it wasn't very diverse at all. And so it was very difficult for me because I was so used to being around so many different cultures of people and so many different types of people. And I'm a huge extrovert. And so that was, it was difficult for me because I just felt like I was talking to the same person all the time, like no matter who it was, because nobody had any kind of different perspectives or different backgrounds or anything like that. I don't feel super accepted in Southern Minnesota. I don't feel like it's a place that people make a huge effort to make sure that everybody feels accepted. Um, I often told my mom when I was younger, like I never wanted to come back here because I always felt like it was very clicky. Like everybody had their their small groups that they hung out with and had like these people over here, these people over here. And 
nobody really like commingled. Everybody was kind of hanging out with people who were in their same like income bracket and their parents hung out with each other. So they often had like similar careers and things like that. Um, and that was different for me because in Dallas, I was, I would hang out with anybody. Like there were people who were super wealthy that went to our school and there were people who were, had nothing that went to our school and everybody was just the same. And um, it just, it feels very different. You feel like you're an outsider here oftentimes, especially because a lot of the people who live here, they were born here, they were raised here. A lot of new people don't really come here or at least they didn't back then. So it's just like, you kind of have to shove yourself in somewhere and find a group of people to fit in with. And it, it's really difficult. And even as an adult now, I find that happening because I'm very outspoken and I'm very much an extrovert and I will talk to anybody and strike up a conversation and make a friend with anybody. And it's, it's even difficult for me to make friends here compared to like when I go to Texas, I'm talking to the lady that's walking down the street. <laughs> like I meet a lot of people and I have a lot of like different acquaintances that I come into contact with and keep in touch with even um, because people just are more welcoming and I even feel like people are more friendly there than here. So much stuff like Juneteenth was already a thing there and like MLK Day is a huge parade and there's so much stuff centered around diversity in Dallas that it's just, it's normal. So it's not like here, I feel like it's, we have to fight for the acknowledgement for that type of thing. Like they don't teach black history in schools here. They teach it there, at least some. I mean, I don't think any places really do a wonderful job on that, but they at least go a little bit more in depth. It's not just MLK and Rosa Parks. There is definitely more of a sense a sense of community here in Mankato because it's such a small town. So like all the people who are involved in everything like Bukata and um, all the other families that we know that are involved in Juneteenth and the Diversity Council and all the other stuff that we do, even just like our events that we have at our shop that we invite everybody to. Um, our pastor, Pastor Staley and his family. And so we have our own little like tight knit group of diverse people because we have like black, white, everybody kind of is just in there together and it's our own little community within Mankato. But as a whole, I don't really think so. Race was present in my life from the time that I was a small child. Um, when I was younger, I hear this story all the time from my mom. Uh, she tells me my mom and her best friend, they were best friends since kindergarten and her daughter and myself were born six months apart and we used to always spend time together. And from what I understand of the story, I was too young to remember, but um, our neighbor, or it was either our neighbor or their neighbor was a member of the KKK. And he was very confident in that. He was very proud of it. And I remember like, he was just a jerk. Like it was, and we had to deal with that when I was younger. And that was one of the final straws that my mom says, um, it was one of the final reasons that she was finally like, okay, we're just gonna get out of here. We're gonna move to Texas. My dad's family had started moving down there slowly. They're all from Milwaukee. Um, and they started moving down there slowly. And finally, my mom was just like, I cannot do this anymore. Because, you know, you have this white woman, white woman in the late nineties with two small biracial kids living in Mankato when there was, I mean, she graduated in 94 and there was one black person in her class. That's it. Um, so it, it started happening. It started being an issue from the time I was little. Like it was, it was always a thing. I've never not known what it was like for race to be an issue. My mom and my stepdad are here. And then um, all of my siblings are here in Minnesota as well, except for one. And that's just because he's in the army. So um, he lives elsewhere, but otherwise he would live here too. Um, and that was, that is the primary factor of me staying here and me coming back here is because my, half of my family is here. Um, my dad still lives in Texas. And so that's why I've been like back and forth between the two, even as an adult, I've moved back and forth a little bit because I always have that internal struggle of like, I really love Texas and that's where I feel like is my home. And that's where I feel welcome. That's where I feel like I don't have to 
take part in a lot of the stuff that I'm having to take part in now because it's just a little bit more understood there. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely racism in the South. There, it's there in Texas, it's there in Dallas. But a lot of what I can appreciate about it in Texas is that people are outspoken. They're gonna tell you, like you know who, who believes what, you know who doesn't like you, you know where you should and shouldn't go. But a lot of it that I see here is very passive aggressive. Like you're gonna get passed over for job interviews. You're gonna get passed over for opportunities. And there's just small things like people will, people will act like they're okay and they believe other than what something other than what they actually believe. And I don't really appreciate that. And I think it's because I'm such an outspoken person that I, I struggle with that. And I often have issues with that. Um, but my family is pretty much the only reason I'm here that and my job right now, I love my job right now, um, just working with the kids. And part of that has to do with what's going on right now. I can, I can be a mentor to my kids at work and teach them about how they can become active and how they can make sure that they're heard and how they can become productive members of Mankato and help Southern Minnesota as a whole change and be a different place. My reactions to what's going on right now, I feel like they're mixed just like any other person of color. It it swings around from a day-to-day -day basis. I, I mean, I felt angry, hurt, confused, annoyed. Um, you have to be a constant source of information for people who are not persons of color. Um, and. I feel oftentimes rather than actually going out and doing research and learning what they need to learn and reading and just being active, a lot of people just fall on us to explain everything to them and to to represent black people as a whole. And I can't represent every black person in Mankato. My feelings are my feelings and everybody has their own and they're all different. But that definitely has been very exhausting. Um, I've kind of been slightly less active the past two weeks or so because it's just, it takes a toll on your mental health when you're constantly seeing people be killed because they look like you and um, people around you defending that for whatever their reason might be, even if they, they think that they have good reasons or they think that they know what happened or they think that there's an explanation, there never really is. And it's, it's definitely difficult with what's going on being biracial right now because um, people often feel like I don't embrace the fact that I'm half white and I just embrace the fact that I'm black. But it's not, there's not as much to embrace as a white person because the white side of my family doesn't have the struggles that the black side of my family has and they don't have that cultural identity that's wrapped up in all the experience that we've had, that we've had over generations of trauma and experiences. Being biracial brings a different perspective because you, you don't have the same experiences as other people around you. And even though we are half white and we are half black, I tend to identify more as just black because when the world looks at me, they don't see a white woman, they see a black woman. And so people often say, well, why don't you embrace your white side? I had a friend even in middle school that used to always ask me, how come you don't really embrace your white side? I'm like, there's not a ton to embrace. Like, there's not really a lot of white culture, whereas black culture is a definite thing. Like, we have a strong sense of community and um, just the whole, it takes a village. I feel like that's a super predominant belief in black culture and it's not that way in, in um, white families and that's something that's very different too but just people often struggle with the fact that I am so pro-black and I embrace my blackness so much but it's something that I can't hide I can't change you know I get pale in the winter but I still look like I'm black <laughs> I can't pass off as white and then you have my brother who is the same way he embraces his blackness but he basically looks white. He's very, very, very light. He's very fair skinned, but he's still like pro-black. And that often confuses people sometimes because they think he's just white. He has a looser curl pattern and I have just super kinky small curls and 
it's very it's very different and it's very interesting to hear people's opinions um, when I ask for them. <laughs> when I don't ask for them, it's not so interesting. But um, sometimes it is interesting because they they have different beliefs on how we should handle being biracial and how we should handle accepting who we are. And I get a lot of questions because even like I wear head wraps often and I get a lot of questions about that too. Like, how can you wear that? Cause you're not Muslim and you're not, it's not a religious thing. And just explain to people like it's, it's part of me embracing my culture and it's something that my ancestors would have worn and it's just a cultural thing. But um, just those little small things that a lot of um, non-black people don't understand. I think that the most important thing that white people can do for us as an ally is listen to what we're saying and listen to understand, not listening to respond. Um, because so frequently I have conversations with people and they, oh, but this, oh, but this, oh, but this, and, and this happened and this is not true. and. It's just, you don't always have to even say anything back. Just listen to understand. Understand where we're coming from, listen to our experiences, and don't discount the fact, like I understand that slavery was hundreds of years ago, but the implications from that are still current. They're still ongoing. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. You wouldn't, just, everybody says all the time, you wouldn't tell a Holocaust survivor to get over it. You wouldn't tell their, the generations after them to get over it. They're gonna keep that history and they're gonna hold it um, close to them and they're gonna remember it. And that's how it is too. I mean, my I have documents from my, I believe it's four greats, great, 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 great grandmother. She lived to be 119 years old and she was a slave when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And she actually was freed when, she was freed by soldiers who came to the plantation that she was on and told them that they were free and she was there with her brother and they were freed and she never saw her brother again, but she um, got married and they grew cotton and it wasn't that far away. Like it was it was four, four generations or four grades ago. Um, and I feel like that's something that people really have to understand is that it's really not as far away as you think it is. And those implications are still there and the consequences of it are still happening and things are still changing because of it and people don't want to believe that and don't want to accept that but I think that's the biggest thing that can happen because in order for anything to change you have to first admit what the problem is just like if you want an addict to seek treatment they have to admit that they have a problem so we as a country and as a community have to admit that we have issues because of the past.